Welcome to Media Path. I am Louise Palanker. And I'm Fritz Coleman. Here on Media Path, we take you on an exploration through books and movies and web content that will interest and delight you. Now, you may be saying, Wheezy, nobody still says web. Or you may be saying, wow, Wheezy, you just made the word web cool again because you're, you're such an influencer. More likely, you're just saying, okay, enough, start the show. So, Fritz, I am currently listening to a book from a new writer of note. He is a Barack Obama. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, him. Yeah. So I'm just listening to the audio book because it's, it's really nice when President Obama reads to me. I just appreciate and like that. And I also like when uh, media path travel finds overlapping narrative, which is where like when you dive deeply into a subject and then you find yourself kind of knowing the story that's about to be told because you read that story from another perspective from, say, Michelle Obama. Heard of her? She's also good. Uh, so, yeah, I read Dreams of My Father, which was Obama's first book. He was commissioned to write this book as an impressive young Harvard law student. Obama, the son of a black African father, was raised by a white American family in Hawaii and in Indonesia. And he tells of his search for meaning and purpose in the world as a black American. And then in Michelle's book, she she talks about how her trajectory and her destiny intersects, intertwines, and then complements that of her husband. And I also really want to recommend, podcast fans, uh, a podcast called Making Obama. It's from WBEZ Chicago. And here, former President Barack Obama, along with key advisors, mentors, and, and rivals, tells the story of his climb from Chicago to the national stage. So it's all good stuff. Yeah. I don't care what your politics are. I just wish Barack Obama would take a chunk out of every day and speak to us, because to me, his voice is like bat teen on a scratched soul. I just love listening to him talk. He's so smart and articulate and low-key and, and non-confrontational. It doesn't matter what your politics are. Just the sanity of it is so refreshing. And he did an hour special on MSNBC talking about this book and his nonprofit project. Uh, and I, I have a lot of respect for the gentleman. Yes. And, and he's written a lot of books. Two yeah, more I read the that second I, one. That the, I did. The, oh, you did? Yeah. Which How was, was that? It was fantastic. You know, and... and and I, I got the same feeling reading Hillary Clinton's book, where a lot of politicians, you want to accuse of just coming up with some great bullet points to run a campaign on. But when you read both Hillary's book and uh, and Barack Obama's book, and this might be true for presidents from the other side, too, they're just the most recent candidates, you realize that these were these were passions of theirs going back to the beginning of their public service. So it's not just about the platform. It's about their consciousness, about their soul. So I just loved reading it. And, and you, know, you know, I'm a fan. I know. And I think when you read someone's book, you kind of learn who they are in a way that makes you feel like you know them. So if you if you're getting absorbed in politics at, at this phase of your life and you want to know more about how the people who lead us, how they think and feel and what guides and drives them and compels them. Joe Biden has two books and the most recent called Promise Me Dad. And then Jill, Jill Biden, Dr. Jill Biden has a book. So I don't know. I just think reading these books helps us feel like we're part we're part of the whole fabric of what they're doing and how we're all going to you know, pull ourselves together and, and, and move forward in a positive way. So, yep. Now, Fritz, tell us I, about your friend who's joining. Well, I have a guest today. I'm so happy because I'm so passionate about this organization that we both share a passion for. She's Sharon Townsend. She is the development director for the Children's Burn Foundation, which is centered here in Los Angeles. I'm on the board of this organization. And it's a time of year when we want you to understand their mission. And I would implore you, this is not me just babbling about a passion. You need to go to their website and be moved by what they do. Their overall mandate is that every child who has been severely burned, not only in the United States, but around the world, every child under these circumstances deserves full support so they can have full lives. Children's Burn Foundation provides full recovery programs for burn victims, support groups for the family, camps, holiday parties, burn prevention, international programs. Since their inception, they have served 85,000 burn children. And I've said this, and Sharon knows I mean it, I think the Children's Burn Foundation, because they accept people from all over the globe does more for international relations for the United States 
than the State Department does. She just, th this organization just kind of represents the best of America. We raise money so that children can support sometimes dozens of surgeries and the long, excruciating recovery process. This is a very long way to welcome my friend, Sharon. Sorry, Sharon, I should have said welcome earlier. Oh, thank you, Fritz. It's just an honor to be here. And, and Fritz and I have had a long time relationship and relationship to fire departments and raising money and so proud that he's been such a longtime supporter as an MC of our gala every year for Children's Burn Foundation. You know, uh, burns are a world global health crisis. Um, the World Health Organization declared burns a world health crisis, and that's because there's 350 people that die every single day from burns. Um, in the United States, burns are one of the top leading causes of death for children under the age of 14. And I bet you didn't know that scald burns are actually one of the top emergencies treated for children under the age of five. Um, and as you go through your day today, um, every two hours someone dies from burns and every 23 minutes someone is injured from burns. Um, and in Los Angeles, Burns are happening more and more. You know that in California that fires have become just a long season. And there's been an increase in fires. And part of that is due, according to Ralph Terrazas, our LA City Fire Chief, because we're building and living in denser communities. Um, in fact, last year alone, over 3,655 people died from burns in the United States. 340 wow. of those are children. And the saddest part of this is most of those are preventable. The CDC reports that burns are one of the top injuries that are preventable. I, I, I want you to, this is the, when we do this gala every year, and these passionate people that support this organization, the transformative moment of the gala is when they show a child before their surgeries and then after the miracle of, uh, of the gift of these surgeons who are able to perform this uh, work. But tell some of the individual stories because people will be blown away at the circumstances I, that I think are, are called to our attention. You're absolutely right. So I'm thinking of Wendy. Um, Wendy was from Mexico and she was burned just two years ago when her mother's phone was charging and it exploded. It caught the house on fire. Um, and Wendy was caught in this fire. And Wendy, her mother and her father literally showed up at our doorstep in our office on a Friday afternoon at four o'clock knocking on our office door. And her elementary school from Sun Valley sent her to us. She had had treatment in Hildago and then came back up to um, Los Angeles with her father and knocked on her door. Wendy's burns were very severe, covering her face, her hands. And, and often, for those of you that aren't familiar with burns, your skin melts just, just like a candle melts. And so you'll get contractures. You might not be able to open your eyes. You have contractures in your hands, not being able to hold or move things like normal people. But they showed up at our doorstep, and this is a picture of Wendy here. Um, Wendy, at the same time, suffered from bullying from her um, classmates in school. So we were able to get her further surgeries. She still is having surgery. She has still a long journey ahead of us. But another thing we were able to do is to send a counselor to her school to talk with the other children in that classroom um, and to talk about Wendy's burns and to discuss this with the parents so they could be more open to a child that has suffered like this. Unbelievable. And, and I want to tell another part of the story. These, these people came to the United States. They gave up their jobs in their home and moved here because it was the only place that would offer the treatment. Then when they got here, they couldn't afford the treatment. So they came to Children's Burn Foundation. You offered the many surgeries, the support for the family, the child life specialist, support for the family and socializing with other burn victims. And uh, it's, it, it's miraculous. Tell the story about Asia that was the victim of a barrel bomb in Syria. I, I, I hope I can do it without crying. <laughs> I actually had the privilege with Tanya, uh, my program officer, to meet her at the airport when she came from Syria. Um, she was burned by a Russian barrel bomb, um, her and another child, Hamama, who was 18 at the time. And they, we worked together with the Syrian Institute, who was able to get them to the United States, work closely with the State Department. Um, Aisha and, and her mama were burned so significantly to the point they almost needed 
um, a face transplant. And I can share with you, my husband and I were driving Aisha home from camp um, last summer and turned around and looked at her because I heard this little child snoring and looked at the back seat of her buckled up in the, in the back seat and her eyes were wide open. And I realized because of her burn, she was unable to close her eyes and sleeps with her eyes open. And it was the most heartwarming experience, but I'm happy to say as of recently, she's had extensive surgery. She now can actually close her eyes, something that you and I take for granted. Um, she's had multiple surgeries on her face, her hands, and she will be here with us for a while. She's been here nearly two years with us. Yeah, and, and the thing about it is these surgeries are intensely expensive, although many of the surgeons, like it started out at the Sherman Oaks Burn Center with Dr. Grossman, who's world famous, and his son, but stuff is done all over. For instance, you facilitated uh, Asia getting her uh, burn surgery at Shriners in Pasadena, her hand surgery at Cedars, and all this stuff is expensive. And, and one of the most expensive parts of it is not necessarily the medical procedures, but having the family in this country, often from poor circumstances, that can't afford it. So the Children's Burn Foundation supports these families and these victims. And all this to say, Sharon, we want people to think about the Children's Burn Foundation on Giving Tuesday, which is Tuesday, December 1st. It's designed to be philanthropic after Cyber Monday. And that's designed to be something after Black Friday, which is to me would be uh, hell is having to go to a store on Black Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, would you please think about this amazing organization? Just go to the website and look at the work they do and you'll understand how important it is. Where should they go? What's, give us the web address. Um, it's www.childburn.org, childburn.org. And we will love you forever. Sharon, you do great work. I came uh, to our friendship through your work with the Glendale Fire Department. You, you've you been on both sides of the fire line and really have done amazing work. So I thank appreciate you. what you do. And thank Wheezy, you. thank you for giving us an opportunity to talk about this. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. It's vital. And I just, I'm, I so commend you for the work that you're doing. You are a blessing. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you. And we'd like to now... Welcome, my very good friend, Jordan Zaslow. Jordan is a director, producer, creator who has just wrapped her first election cycle as executive director and creative lead of Women for the Win. The team is now looking towards continuing their work in upcoming elections. Jordan, welcome and tell us about Women for the Win. Yeah, Women for the Win is <clears throat> a coalition of professionals from the media industry from advertising, film, television, uh, digital media, you name it. Um, and we, you know, kind of use our collective talents to create campaign ads and digital content for women who are running for political office. Um, and we, this, this cycle is kind of unique because, um, you know, we we're spread all across the country and we had weekly Zooms um, and, you know, we kind of were, we're working on this ragtag um, effort with the most incredible candidates imaginable and um, many of the volunteers I've, I've still yet to meet. And I spent like all of my waking hours with them. So right. On Zoom. Like, are you 3D? Because you're going to have to prove it. Right. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about some of the candidates. I know you had a you had a win with Cori Bush. What you know, what else went on and who would you like to talk about? Yeah, Cori Bush is incredible. She um, she kind of had a few different um, reasons why she came into um, notoriety. Originally, she was um, an activist during the Ferguson uprising, and she, um, you know, has continued her her efforts in Ferguson and, and all across the country. Um, and she's she's going to be in Congress, which is just absolutely incredible. She was just an ordinary woman with you know the passion for activism and the passion for her cause, and she was a nurse and a single mother, and um, now she's going to be a congresswoman representing her district, which is like. Every time I think about it, it just gives me so much hope. Well, let's look at the spot. And and Fritz, I'm going to ask you whenever we show Jordan's work, if you see uh, text on the screen to go ahead and read that in your very announcery voice. <laughs> Pardon me, let me clear my throat. All right. So let's look at the Cory Bush spot. Missouri's first district has been represented by the same family for over 50 years. I don't buy it when people say that they've done a remarkable job. St. Louis deserves more.
I'm someone who never thought I would ever run for Congress. I never thought I would ever run for office. I'm running for this seat because change has to happen. For years, I've been an essential worker. That heart for the community, that heart has to be seated in Congress. I'm running because my son's life matters. My daughter, her life matters. The lives of people all over our area, those lives matter. It's time for St. Louis to grow and to prosper. And that prosperity has to be felt by all St. Louis. We will have an amazing St. Louis. You deserve it, your children deserve it, your legacy deserves it. I'm Corey Bush, and I approve this message. How does it feel to hear a, a politician say to you that they approve the message? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? So, so she, she, she became a little bit famous after she was in um, the documentary Knock Down the House. Yeah. Um, but she didn't, you know, she didn't win. Yeah. Um, in that cycle in, I think it was 2018. Yeah, AOC was the only one in that documentary who won that. And let's keep going. We actually worked with Paula Jean Swearingen also, who was also in that documentary. She also oh. didn't win. She ran for senator um, of West Virginia. And she's all, she's another one who is just, I, I wish she won because West Virginia deserves someone like her. But, um, but Corey's a successor, a great success. And we're very happy. Um, but when we first met her, you know, she was, she was just hoping that she was going to, we met her before the primary. So she wasn't sure that she would win. It was still, you know, a little bit of a long shot. People knew who she was, but they certainly, you know, um, there was no reason to believe that it wasn't going to be a really tough fight, which it certainly was. Um, so when we first met her, it was kind of like a, it was still a David and Goliath situation. Um, and now she's, you know, she's going to be a congresswoman. She's going to be, you know, she's, she's definitely going to be a, a superstar. So how does the process work? Do, 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 does a campaign uh, chief of staff come to you and say, this is what we'd like to do, this is the concept we're trying to get across, or are you involved in the creation of the concept to fit the candidate? We've, it's gone a variety of ways. Um, in the beginning, we sort of reached out to every campaign just to let them know, you know our, the service that we were offering and kind of what we um, were up to, because we hadn't really, you know, we, no one really heard of us. We had like, 300 followers or something on Instagram. Um, so at first it was kind of like we extended the offer and then, you know, as soon as we heard back from people, we started collaborating. Um, but then as people started to hear about Women for the Win, as our Instagram following grew, as, you know, all of these other women that we had been working with kind of told their peers in, you know, their different circles about what we were doing, um, we started, you know, getting kind of like inbound requests. Um, and oftentimes, you know, at that point, they kind of were hoping that we would come with an idea. Um, so it, it was both, it was like a collaboration for the most part, but, um, you know, a lot of the time they didn't have time to think about the, you know, the creative. So they were eager for us to just kind of hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. And would wow. they usually approve your creation or would they have notes and you, you it was a work in progress as you, as you communicated? <laughs> that also varied, but I, I will say from having worked in branded content before this, I have never in my life received fewer <laughs> notes. Really? Uh, oh my God. They, no, they were just like, thank you so much. This is great. Let's just, let's just throw her up on online. Um, you know, the notes were often very um, specific, like, you know, things with the FEC, compliance, making sure that we were um, following all the regulations. But in terms of the creative, I think they were just excited that a group of talented, you know, ta uh, talented creatives we're, con we're contributing to their storytelling. Now, do you contribute towards helping it catch fire? Is that part of the package? We can. Um, often they are working with agencies who are doing that, but um, certainly we have, we have political strategists, we have marketing strategists, we have a ton of different people from all areas of the industry who specialize in marketing and distribution. So yeah, that was definitely something that we helped with too. Some of your candidates that are from the smaller markets, I, I mean, television advertising is intensely expensive. And many people think the whole system of advertising should be revamped where they bring back the equal time clause and, and a certain amount of political advertising should be free. 
Do you run into that in, in smaller markets, for instance, rural candidates where you can do this great spot, but who can afford to buy the ads? It seems very expensive. That's a really good question. So the prices do depend on the market. So if it's a smaller market, it is usually less expensive. However, this election, as I'm sure you've read, was the most heavily funded election cycle like in recorded history. Yeah. So what ended up happening was that um, that inflated the prices of um, of media buys. So like, for example, the Senate races in those um, in those states had tons of money coming in. So, you know, and then they were all competing for these for these, um, you know, limited amount of spots on um, on broadcast. So mm -hmm. then, you know, the people who could afford to do it funneled all of their money in and then the down ballot candidates just kind of like didn't even have a chance. Um, so that was that was like a, a bummer. And, and that's a really good point that you brought up that we should definitely figure out a, a better way. Well, what's the difference, though, in terms of impact between something going viral or the potential for it to do that and actually being on broadcast television? You know, people your age, I don't think you watch broadcast television, do you? You probably don't see commercials. So where are we in that in that balance? The problem is that there's so many different types of voters and they're consuming their media in so many different types of ways. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're running for office and you have to, you know, appeal to a, a wide range of constituents, um, it's going to be expensive. It's just, there's so many different ways that you have to reach out. And the, the biggest issue actually this cycle was the fact that a lot of the grassroots candidates weren't able to go door to door or have, you know, pizza parties or um, town halls in person, um, which is usually like a very cost effective way of meeting the voters where they are. Mm. So, yeah. That's a great point. Did, did you notice the difference uh, in messaging? You know, there's this big divide now, and we saw it in the election results between uh, urban voters, uh, more uh, diverse voting blocks in urban areas and the rural areas. You have to be really conscious of your messaging when you have, I don't want to say less sophisticated, but uh, uh, a more kind of a, a, a base um, rural audience for, for who you're working with. I, I mean, it just seems like there's such a big divide. You would have to, you would have to target your political ads differently depending on the geography. Absolutely. Um, in the case of our Senate candidates that absolutely applied, um, in the case of our con congressional and more local candidates, um, they kind of knew their districts, um, you know, better than anyone, especially because for the most part, they lived there their whole lives. Um, so in that case, we kind of looked to them for the messaging, like, you know, me, a, a girl who was, you know, talking to them from Brooklyn, New York, I was literally like, oh, broadband is an issue in Alabama. <laughs> this is literally the first I'm hearing of that. And I feel so ignorant, but I didn't, it didn't occur to me until I started working with these more rural candidates, um, that the issues that they were going to be, um, you know, having to cover or just, I had no, I really truly had, had no clue. And I'm, and I, now I know a lot more, but when I was just starting, I didn't. So the messaging, um, I think that's the reason that these women were running was because they just, they know exactly what they need to say and they know exactly what their constituents need. And they were kind of the experts on, you know, at least on what the messaging should be. And then we kind of did the rest. Did, did candidates tend to want uplifting messages or did they want messaging that would go after? I mean, I noticed in the Cori Bush, she would just kind of opened by saying, you guys, all right, this is who's been leading. <laughs> it's, these people are horrible. I mean, she, she didn't go, she didn't go dark, but she just kind of laid it out there. So what was... So, yeah. yeah, that's a really good question. And that's actually one place that the candidates look to us for guidance a lot of the time because they would kind of, you know, in some cases we would do an interview and then we would kind of cut down the interview into a story and in other times, and that was what we did with Corey actually. And then in other cases we would write a script and the script would be, you know, kind of like we'd go back and forth on what to say and how heavily to, you know, how heavy handed to be with the um, opposition stuff. Um, and it varied. I mean, in some cases, you know, like in the case of Corey and, and we had other candidates that were 
running against incumbents, it was like, so, you know, you almost could, you could be extremely subtle and still get the point across. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, this is what this incumbent has been promising you, you know, has he delivered (laughs) and then kind of like fill in the blanks. Um, We also had a lot of candidates who wanted to just kind of tell the audience about themselves because their story was so compelling and um, and made so much sense for them to be the one representing the voters in their district because they really truly were like the representative like that's you know their background and the backgrounds of the people voting for them were so similar mm-hmm. very relatable so that's now what are you hoping to do moving forward I mean it must have been hopefully you slept in the morning <laughs> after the election and you have to be you have to be thinking well this this well this really feels good to be able to uh, use my gift in this fashion uh, it, going into the field that you've gone into to know that you can you can affect public policy in such a positive way in people's lives it must be very gratifying so what are you guys talking about moving forward yeah we're talking a lot <laughs> we're trying to figure it out um, because there's so many there's so much to do and there's so many people to help we're kind of figuring out, you know, how to, how to streamline the process and how to become more of a well-oiled machine so that we can, you know, scale and we can sustain this model and, um, you know, just continue helping people for um, decades to come. But I mean, uh, in a perfect world, the, the, the system would change and we wouldn't be necessary anymore. Well, um, it just feels like there's a lot of crossed wires and there's a lot of people who have never voted because they just always felt like, what's the point? They're everyone's bad and they're not getting the messaging accurately to understand how much their lives could change if they elected people who really do have their best interests in mind. And that's why they went into public life. So I feel like like if you take the example of, let's say, Cuban American vote in Miami, just as an example, where where people received propaganda took it in and voted accordingly. How can you get your message to people that need to hear the truth? Yeah. And I think that that's something that will absolutely be, um, I think that candidates in the, in the upcoming cycles will have a much easier time with that, with that issue than the the 2020 cycle candidates. Um, Just because I think the, the fact that, that our candidates were competing on the same airwaves and in the same media space as all of that propaganda, um, where, and they couldn't, you know, kind of like tell their own story, their own way in person. Um, that was really hard. That was really, really hard. And there is so much, um, disinformation and especially in the, you know, in the red States. Um, so I think, and that's, you know, that is one reason why videos, digital content, and, and the like are, you know, we're critical this time because it was literally the only way that the candidates could set the record straight. Would you accept business from a male candidate? Would women for the win accept <laughs> business are, from a, a male wait, candidate? Fritz, are you announcing your candidacy? <laughs> no, here's what I'm announcing. I'm announcing that, as I said at the beginning, I think men could learn from your uh heartfelt approach to getting the point across that seems to be lacking in a lot of the real gritty street level politics of today. I was very moved by it. And I I, I just think uh, there's probably a male candidate or two that might benefit from your sort of a, a hug rather than hitting somebody in the face with a boxing glove. Mm. I don't know if that makes any sense. It does, because there's a male style to things and then there's a female style to things. You know, we are different. We are wired differently. So accepting that, it's it's that's an interesting question. So I can answer both questions. I can answer for your question and also Weezy's question um, about upcoming projects and what we're going to do next. A lot of the, the team members from Women for the Win have been looking for a way to kind of get involved in, you know, the, the off cycle. Um and I already have my company, Love and Fireworks, which has, you know, before the election had been doing branded content and other types of content. Um, so now we're expanding our offering and we're going to be producing um, campaign content and social impact and um, political action committees uh, content as well. So 
if a male candidate would like to work with us, they should go through that channel. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, now your mother said that I must ask you about the title of your company, Love and Fireworks. Yes. So Love and Fireworks is the name of my company. Um, and it comes from a story that has now become legend in my family. Um, my parents got married on the 4th of July. So my mother inscribed my father's wedding band, Love and Fireworks Always. Oh my uh, God. <laughs> That's awesome. name is, is just a little nod to, to their love. Oh, that's beautiful. Very Thank cool. you. For sure. Well, this has been a big year for female candidates. 18 and 20 were both. We, we broke through a couple of barriers there. It seems like we're coming into a banner time for your mandate, which is to support female candidates and whatever their political ambitions are. Absolutely. Yeah. Or trans and queer and everybody. Yeah. Yeah. yeah or whoever. And, and another thing, uh, Younger people, Gen X, Gen Y, are very digitally sophisticated, and they're very savvy to being manipulated. Um, do you find it difficult to create something that can appeal to them and not tune them out or raise their BS antenna as they're hearing a message? I only know that because I have a 20-year-old daughter, and it's impossible for me to sound credible with anything that comes out of my mouth. <laughs> and so uh, I just wonder if it's if it's a difficult messaging time because of the, the, the sophistication of kids with social media and online time. So that's a good point. And it's funny that you should ask that because in this age, and I think that this is kind of a trend that's just been getting, just been more and more on the rise since like 2015, which is like this, this trend of authenticity in um, content. And so while, you know, I started my career in Hollywood, as Louise knows, and like the glossy, high production value, big budget look, you know, is still coveted in, in many areas of the industry. In digital content, which is what, you know, Gen Z is and millennials are, are mostly consuming, um, the more authentic something looks, the, the better. And the more it will be, you know, the, the, the more, um, I guess, viral it will probably go if you're trying to make mm -hmm. it go viral. Um, just because, you know, we're watching our friends live their lives, you know, selfie style all day long. So the minute that something looks like, you know, glossy and a little bit more, you know, higher production value, we're kind of like, we skip past it because we think of it as an ad. So if yeah. you make something, you know, sometimes even if we had a bigger budget, we would use, um, a Canon or like, you know, a DSLR, um, just to make sure that it, the, the, the content looked more authentic. So it wouldn't get. Mm. Well, I want to show an example of some of the, uh, the content that you create for, for clients. And for example, the, the American greetings. And I just want to warn you, please at home, have tissue handy. And we're going to talk to Jordan about her process and, uh, take a look at the American greetings, give meeting campaign, if you will, for any. Open when you need to feel loved. I'm doing Fritz's job. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> These people think they're here to talk about the most meaningful card they ever received. We have a surprise waiting for them. <laughs> my stepchildren I met when they were about nine. I was very surprised when I got my first Mother's Day card. I didn't know if I would get one. I don't have any biological children. I was serving a woman at a restaurant, and then at the end of it, I dropped the check. When I came back to the table, there was nothing on the table, no tip or anything. Two weeks later, I get this card. This is something I will keep for the rest of my life, honestly. My card is from my guidance counselor, Ms. Gravel. She helped me get into college. My friend left me this card one day. I had been having some difficult things going on with my family. It's exactly what I needed, and I didn't even know it. My math teacher gave me um, a box that had 10 letters in them that I could take with me when I moved to New York. She was the person that really helped me get through the really, really hard times in high school. They have no idea that people they're talking about can hear everything they're saying. She's very kind, she's very giving, she's invested in what she does, and she genuinely cares. As a stepmother, you really never know how you're doing. She was able to get all the faculty and staff 
who was a part of helping my journey to college, signed the card. I'm my school district's homeless liaison. I was able to help Leon out. He's the reason I do what I do at work. We were coming from Lancaster, Pennsylvania to surprise Lisa. She was a waitress who had waited on us. I don't think I've gotten the chance to tell her how much this meant to me at the time and still does. Um, maybe I'll write her a card and let her know. <laughs> and I hope that I can make her feel half as, oh my God. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> she has this way of just making a bad day a good day. Like she's like an energy booster. Like she's like, talk to her and then boom. Miss Gravel. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yes, you bet you no. Never seen me again, right? Are you oh. serious? Yes, yes, yes. Oh my god. god. <laughs> <laughs> What? <laughs> oh I'm reading the card you wrote. You remember this one? I do. Mm hmm. Do you remember this one? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Guys, I love Miss Gravel. Like, you see all that? I wrote that. Wow. Hi. She sent her a card, too. I will hold on to this because it seriously <laughs> reminds me of the kindness of strangers of your kindness. And I still love you, and I'm still rooting for you, and I'm still proud of you. You're seriously in my heart forever. I think about you every day. I think I am in a funny way a little um, embarrassed about how much it meant to me. I think people save cards because it's sort of a snapshot of someone's most tender, loving thoughts to you. and. Those are special moments. I am very grateful. Thank you, Ms. Gravel. Love, Leon Moni. Wow, oh, man, I'm telling you right now. Did you come up with a concept for that? Mm -hmm. That is beyond spectacular thank you so talk, talk about setting this up and setting up the surprises and all the all that is, is involved can i tell you if i could just produce social experiments every single day until i die i'd be so happy you love them so much <laughs> so much fun but yeah i mean and, and then being there that day like i was crying the entire day yeah i was gonna say there must be crying and directing and that's kind of long form. I mean, it couldn't have been on broadcast television, right? That was like two minutes long. Right. That was for digital. Yeah. Really, they, really beautiful. They might have done a cut down. I'm not sure. Now, um, is there it? It, it sounds. It seems to me like your 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 strategy is get in quick with the hook. So there's an emotional investment within the first. I don't know, 15 seconds. I don't know if you have this down to a formula, but it's like right away you're like. Okay, I'm ready to go. Let's see what happens because you lay it out there just real simply with the text on the screen. Here's what we did. Here's what's about to happen. And people are like, yeah, sign me up. So oh. learning how to create content for the digital age is a completely different, um, yeah, formula, I guess is a good word for it because no one bought tickets and, you know, filed into a theater to watch what you made. Like you kind of have to draw them in with the actual content. You can't just mm -hmm. you know, hope that they'll stick around to see if it's good or not. Um, you have to, you know, kind of set the stakes, make sure that there's a reason for them to keep watching, that they know, and you know, they have enough, just enough context to know that this is something that could be interesting to them and not all the context because, you know, you have to have a curiosity gap. Um, so that's, that's very, um, that's a good observation, Wheezy. <laughs> and then you have to call Mrs. Grinnell, like, what are you doing? I'm sending you a ticket. <laughs> I mean, right? You have to, you have to organize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was really crazy to organize, especially because you know, in a lot of those cases, we had like we were going off of like a first name, <laughs> like literally a first name. So that you didn't tip your, you tip the payoff. You had to say like, okay, well, who meant a lot to you? You know, like so the, the call Madge. Okay, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> The call out was we did a call out and we asked people to um, submit 
you know, themselves and the cards that they have been keeping for years. So it was true. That really was the call out. And then people submitted their um, stories and submitted the cards and what they said and, you know, a little bit of the story behind them. And then we, you know, went through hundreds of submissions and chose the most compelling ones. And obviously because we were producing this and we didn't have a very big turnaround, many of the stories, you know, um, hopefully we're, the, we're as easy to pull off as possible um, and still, you know, be compelling. But yeah, it was li like truly in, in some of those cases, it was like, I don't know her last name. Like I, she was my, you know, she was this woman that I, I saw one time. <laughs> this is, yeah, the lady in the restaurant, wow. like, how did you find her? Right, right. <laughs> no. Yeah, I don't know how we did it. I keep thinking like, we, we just, um, and that's actually a lot of the people on my team um, have journalism backgrounds, which I think are, is useful. Do you have the same detective. members of your team doing the political stuff as doing the non-political stuff? Some of them, yeah, some of them are the same. A lot of them are the same. And then you like, so you can take any, any company comes to you and says, we'd like, we love your work. We'd like to do something far, uh, heartwarming. And you're, are you like, but you guys make paint. So like, how do I, or do they just come to you and you're like, okay, let's see what's heartwarming about paint. So in a lot of cases, it's like, well, you know, we kind of ask them a bunch of leading questions. Like for example, we worked with an insurance company. And our first response to their RFP was like, you know, explainer videos about insurance or something, just hoping, you know, thinking that that was what they wanted. And then when they didn't like those ideas, I think, you know, we asked them on the call, you know, we had like a follow-up call and we said, okay, what, what would you imagine going on the end card? Like, what's your, you know, campaign slogan? Mm. And we'll go from there. And mm -hmm. their campaign slogan in that case was, um, there, it was American Family Insurance, and their campaign slogan was, with the right support, any dream is possible. So we said, okay, we're going to go back to work based on that, and I think we'll come up with something great, and we did. So, Wow. That's so impressive. And then tell us that about... Was, yeah, go ahead, go Chrissy. Ahead. Go, I, I, I just wanted to ask one question about um, uh, women's issues, uh, and two questions. Looking back on the cycle, on the 18 and the 20 cycle, was there a particular type or a particular flavor that you found worked best, uh, that you found the most response to? In terms of storytelling, you mean? Yeah. Did you look back and say, yes, as a matter of fact, we'd like to take that and spread that to other people because it, it seemed to really resonate with a certain group of people. So there's a trend right now in political advertising that I don't, I don't really know how it became a trend and I don't think I believe in it really, which is telling the candidate's story and kind of, you know, kind of explaining why this candidate understands the issues because they, you know, come from the, they come from the community and, you know, they're, they're, um, they were born in the same, under the same circumstances that the voters were. I understand in theory why that could work, but I don't think that people are thinking, you know, when they go into the voting booth, I don't know if they're thinking about the candidate's like story as much as, you know, what will this candidate do for me? Issues, yeah. Right. Good so point. we found um, the campaign videos that were about the issues, especially if the issues were super timely, performed the best. We worked with a candidate named Shivana Newsom, and um, she is a co-founder of the Black Lives Matter Greater New York chapter. She's the Bronx lady, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I loved her ads. Yeah, yeah. That was a really, that was probably one of our most viral ads. And so that, you know, performed so well because we released it in, I think, like the first week of June. <laughs> so like people, I mean, like everything she had to say was like everything that people wanted to hear in that exact moment. It was like it couldn't have resonated more. It was like everything she was saying, which was already her messaging for, you know, had been her messaging for years already. Mm -hmm. um, but that was like the moment when everybody was, was open to hearing that message. That message was already in the zeitgeist in that moment. And um, her message, you know, spread kind of because it was already a trending topic. Well, I I want to talk to you about women as candidates in gen in, in like a gener in a generational sense in terms of how we how we view that. It feels like historically men and women have been threatened 
by capable, competent, smart women rising to the the capacity of their arc, you know, like whatever, like, in other words, reaching the high, the highest of their potential. One of the things that I used to see on my report card was Louise is not working to her potential. So I always thought that that was the goal, that you do want to reach your potential. But some generations of voters feel threatened by maybe people of color and women reaching their potential and possibly being smarter than me. Is that something that you that you're sensitive to? Because we do need every vote. We can't get into the psychology of of somebody's insecurities and fix that. We still need you to vote right now. And then we'll address that later on. But do you understand what I'm saying? Like, do you do you want to make sure that your ads aren't condescending or perceived as vote for her because she's smarter than you kind of thing? I think that it's it's so are you asking that because I mentioned that I don't think that the bio videos necessarily yeah, and also in it kind of like meshed with something that I saw Marco Rubio tweet today in in light of Biden's uh, cabinet picks. He said, they're all Ivy Leaguers and this is going to spell our doom. And I'm thinking, if you guys are Ivy Leaguers and willing to devote your life to public service, doesn't that benefit everybody because you're smart and you're well-educated and you're not going in there to take something away from me. You're going in there to represent me. How is I this? I could be wrong, but I think he's a Harvard graduate. So okay. So cool. how is that threatening? And what's that kind of messaging? That's that's going to spell our doom to try to teach people that smart people are a threat. I don't understand. Jordan, help me. So help me, like at least t- tell me that your generation knows better. <laughs> so that's a really really good point, and and I, and it makes me want to sort of. Uh, go back and clarify what I mentioned about the bio okay. videos. Okay. Which is the bio videos just as, you know, in a vacuum, I don't think are the right antidote to this to this issue. I think that just hearing someone's story and not being able to apply it into the context of the time, certainly not enough. I think that making a video about the issues and then tying it somehow into how, you know, your story plays a role or your story, you know, makes you a uniquely... Um, qualified person to handle this problem, something like that. So I think that to answer your your next question, the people in especially the rural areas, people all over our country are feeling disenfranchised. And a lot of the time they have every reason to. Um, There are people in Oklahoma who were in the districts of some of the candidates that we worked with who, if something happens to they have to take they have to be airlifted to a hospital in Texas so they are kind of past the point of caring where <laughs> their leaders went to yeah. college it's kind of like yeah. a purely a matter of survival right yeah so to them it's like if you have all of this you know experience and all you know all of these all of this money and you know you're in this like elite class that I've never even like met and I don't even care because I'm just trying to survive I don't th- you know I think that they're just like great I don't care you went to college help me like take mm-hmm. care of me yeah yeah um, that's an excellent point yeah we don't we don't ask our doctor to be slightly less qualified so as not to intimidate me it's like no (laughs) just really please (laughs) sew me up jordan what you're talking about is going on in north dakota right now where they have the highest spike in the covid cases and you might have to drive two hours to get to a hospital and when you get there they're already overtaxed with their covid response so that's a very real thing you're talking about in many states I mean, I think we we have to be willing to let everyone play to their strengths. It's like, if you grow food, you're a hero because I need food. And if, if you make steel, I need steel. So why are we somehow expecting our leaders to be less informed and less capable so as you know not to make us feel less than? That's not anybody's job. You're the best potato grower. Grow some damn potatoes. I'll buy them. I'm not going to question that you're too good at growing potatoes and I'm outraged. I don't know. Why is it in leadership considered somehow that Marco Rubio would tweet that today? Is that somehow 
a talking point that sticks. Or That was Trump's whole campaign, the elites. Yeah. And by elite, I mean anybody who's ever read a newspaper. But see, that's it, been it, going on since the dawn of time. They use I terms know. like well, that's ivory what, that's tower just a continuation and blah, blah. Of that. Yeah. Jordan, the... the um, with your special sensitivity and talent in the area of women's issues, do you ever get invited to do some like institutional branding about issues that are important to women? For instance, Roe v. Wade, uh, gun violence, health care, any of those broader issues not specific to a particular candidate? Marketing, you know, like marketing. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if I've ever, I mean, you know, I've I've worked with um, like nonprofits and and past. Yeah, and it that. seems like you would be awesome at that because you, you just have a your 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 uh, your humanity is uh, just just oozes out of everything you do, particularly that last thing. That was well. You want to see you want to see some humanity. Uh, I have some humanity on me. All right, so some of Jordan's more more high profile work includes the Blackboard Project. Would you, you want to set that up for us, Jordan? So I was um, working at Ashton Kutcher's digital media company, A Plus, and this was at the at the height of viral content. This was when like the word viral was, well, back when viral um, was still, you know, a very exciting um, word and a very exciting accomplishment to like make something go viral meant that, um, you know, you, you managed to, to hit millions of eyeballs and now that's kind of like a run of the mill, like, if your content didn't hit that many people, then like, why did you even bother making it? Um, but this was back when that was still very novel. And um, so literally the assignment was like, <laughs> make something viral um, for this um, brand, Strayer University, which was one of our first clients for the branded content side. Um, and their um, their campaign for that, for that year was, um, you know, kind of, helping people understand um, the concept of success, that it's never too late um, to succeed. It's never too late. You know, don't give up on your dreams because it's never too late to accomplish them. Um, and so we sent them some concepts based on that um, prompt. And the chalkboard video was born. And I actually remember I, I made like a mock-up of what I hoped the chalkboard would look like at the end. Um, and... So we put up a chalkboard in the middle of Soho in New York City. And at the top, it said, write your biggest regret. Um, and so people, it was a freezing cold day in January. I couldn't believe that anybody stopped, you know, walking to, to um, engage. But tons and tons and tons of people did. It was a huge, huge, um, it was a huge deal that day. And everybody was talking about it and posting it on their Instagram and, um, and writing on, you know, writing their regrets. And um we started because, you know, with social experiments, they're like, just like regular experiments, you start with a hypothesis. So the hypothesis was people will probably regret um, the things that they didn't do more than, you know, anything else. And um, I guess if you watch the video, so should I tee up the rest? Like, yeah. That's cool. Spoiler alert, we were right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it turned out that people really did regret the things that they didn't do. Um, much more than anything else that they wrote. Wow, that's, that's fascinating. All right, let's take a look at that one, Franny. Write your biggest regret. This chalkboard stood in the middle of New York City on a cold day. This guy's taking, they're taking pictures of it. I was afraid, <laughs> afraid, I guess, of failing me. I regret all the time I wasted, not saying yes to things. It's something I've always wanted to do since I was little. Time slipping away, I mean, that's probably the worst feeling in the world, right? Not saying I love you. Oh, I'm not getting my MBA. Never going after my dreams. I've got loads of friends from different walks of life and it's really hard to keep in touch with everyone. Up until recently, I was homeless. If I hadn't hurt the people that I had, maybe I wouldn't have been. I wanted to do so many things, but I can never seem to find the time. I did all the things that were like plan B. I just never did it. Burning bridges, wow, beautiful. 
Never applying to med school. Wow. Thank you. Jordan Wart <laughs> not having enough chalk. That's good. <laughs> All right, y'all. Enjoy. I love him. I love him. Staying in my comfort zone. zone. As the board filled up with so many different stories, we noticed almost all of these regrets had something in common. Not pursuing acting, not getting involved. Not having, not having kids, kids. Oh. before my dad passed away. Not being a oh. best friend. They were about changes not taken. They were about words not spoken. They were about dreams never pursued. But then we gave them an eraser. And changed the music. How long was the board up there, Jordan? A clean board feels, an hour feels like where I want to be. Only an feels hour. Feels like where I want to go. <laughs> that it's not my regret anymore. It's hopeful. Not following my artistic passion. It means there's possibility. Every day is a clean slate. Do the things you'll regret not doing. Really, really beautiful. That's so beautiful. It just makes you cry. Because it's not just that you did the ad and people wrote regrets and they turned out to be what you had what you had anticipated an absence of action is is a regret but and also, most every one of those is a universal regret not living up to your potential like you say wheezy not uh, following my dreams i think everybody has a little flash of all of those at, at one time or another yeah and also just the uh, just the physical experience of having the the chalkboard there and having people be able to see that other people it's not something that you walk by people on the street like any regrets any regrets like you know but this was kind of a community of oh it's okay because I'm seeing how everybody else wrote here, and it makes me feel that it's acceptable. You go around feeling like you're the only person that hasn't lived up to your potential and that has something that you felt that you kind of nags at you that you haven't done. And then you see how universal it is. Really cool. Yeah. I love it. I have it. a question, if I may, yeah, for Dina. Jordan. Mm -hmm. I was just kind of wondering, you know, I'm looking at these videos and I'm thinking back to like the mid 2010s when this kind of content was like really popular. And it reminds me of a time when we were all like so much more open to like forming these um, emotional connections with people we didn't know, with like, you know, experiencing like a broad universal kind of emotional, like, you know, experience. But I'm wondering if, Jordan, you think that as you refer to them, like these social experiments have a place now in a world where we're like really um, kind of yearning to bridge these divides that we feel like we have, but like we ultimately, you know, want to feel like we're all, you know, coming from the same place, yet we're so divided by our political differences and the things that are kind of tearing us apart. I'm wondering what you think about the potential is for this kind of content to come back in that way. I hope so. I, I, I think back to, um, I want to say it was in late 2016. Um, there was a commercial, I think by Heineken where, I don't know if you guys saw this, but where, um, they had a bunch of different people build furniture. I think they were, I think they were like building furniture together. And it turned out that like these people that were like working to collaborating on this project of building furniture, like, you know, had diametrically opposed political opinions and opinions about like immigration and things like that. And um, as soon as they came to realize each other, and then I think, man, I wish I could remember exactly. This was a social experiment commercial, but, mm -hmm. um, and then they watched a video, I think of, of the person that they had just bonded with, um, you know, spouting their opinions that were the opposite of theirs. And they had to kind of reflect on, um, on that fact and, and, you know, that they just saw the humanity in the person that they usually, uh, 
don't want to agree with and don't want to humanize. <laughs> so mm. that I remember that commercial was like a huge um it was it was hugely um uh it was very it was very well uh, regarded and it was widely accepted. I think it was before the election, mm. which is interesting. Um but it was definitely during it was in the time of Trump. Um so that's a really good question, and I hope so, because I think that there's so much that social experiments can um, can solve, because you kind of, you know, when your guard is down like that, you really don't expect to learn about yourself in that moment. I think you expect to know yourself already, and you, you want to stay stubborn in your beliefs, and you want to think that your beliefs are, um, you know, are, are um, permanent. Um, so I think that and that that makes me want to like go <laughs> go make one um about that yeah about that, that i think you know we're we're so we spend so much time on social media for politically engaged and we just you know you start to kind of harden and think anybody that would vote for this person must be just horrible and they are not they are not they're wonderful and you're just not seeing that side of them you're only seeing what they decided to post on twitter as a reflection of their soul it's not a reflection of their soul it's a reflection of something else entirely it's a whole other conversation but um i want to ask you jordan since you are a family friend and and uh I know your parents so well. If you could tell us, because we see how extraordinary you are, and I and I'm just wondering what you think you got from each of your parents. What I and, got, yeah, that's yeah, and just and tell us who they are so that we can celebrate them with you. So my mother um, is a journalist. She has been a news anchor. What did we say? Thirty five years. She was a news anchor for like thirty five years um, in Detroit and in Buffalo, which is how she knows Fritz. Um, and my father um, w passed away, but he was a um, he was a journalist also, and he was an author. Um, and he in the in the earlier um, in his earlier career, he had an advice column in the Chicago Sun Times, and then after that, he wrote um, a column in the Wall Street Journal called "Moving On," which was about life transitions, and that was many people called that the Wall Street Journal's. Um, heart like the heart of the wall street journal or something mm -hmm. like that i wish i could remember exactly i'll have to email you yeah i'm sure they live online correct and well, where, and what do you feel you got from each of them um wow uh from my mother i probably it's so hard this is hard this is a very hard question what did i get me to my parents i mean i hope i got a lot they're my favorite people they're like the two best people in the world um it's easier to know what i got from my dad because i look a lot like him <laughs> uh i guess from my mother i probably got like really good judgment um she's she's a very good judge of character and she's careful um and she has like a little voice in her head that tells her when something is the right thing or the wrong thing um, and I also have that voice. And then the part of me that ignores it from time to time, I got from my father. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then I guess, you know, professionally, probably both of my parents are incredible writers. So I hope that I got some of their chops. Yes. Um, yes. And, you know, they both, they, it's funny because they did such similar work. They both, yeah. you know, worked in. I feel like they're both so super curious and interested, and that all three of you girls got that which makes yeah. life more fun and exciting. Definitely. Yeah. If you find everything interesting. Yeah. 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 That's a really good point. All right. So then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you, I, I think that with the increase, thankfully, of the number of women in politics that you are at the beginning of your career arc, and I hope more people get to see your content because it's really uh, lovely. I don't know if I'm affected by it more now because we're in this COVID thing. So any humanity I sort of <laughs> cling to, but uh, quite seriously, you have a you have a gift, it, and your work is beautiful. Every single one of the things you sent us and what you've played today, and my heart is full for you and for your family and for Sherry, who I knew back in our underpaid radio days. And so it's really fun to have a chance to talk to you and meet you. Thank you, you too. I've heard such wonderful things about you from my mom. She called well, you I'm... her favorite people. Oh, yeah. Actually, we she were... called you both her favorite people. Well, well she's one of them. 
Yeah, she's one she of my favorite. She should be in the advertising business too. If <laughs> my mom, she should be in the she advertising. She is. <laughs> she is one of my favorite people. Honest to God, she, she really is. Poised, yeah. Yeah. Man. Yeah, she I is, love like, her so much. Racist and poised. Per- I did not get that from her. That I know. Yes, sure. you <laughs> did. Yes, you did. Stop it. Oh All my right. God. I'm going to compliment you and tell you that I know how proud your dad is of you, and I know how proud your mom is of you, and uh, it's just uh, wonderful to watch you blossom in this way. It makes my heart very big, and I want to thank- Can I tell your audience the best advice I ever received because it came from you? Oh, my goodness. The best advice that I ever received, and anytime that someone asks me this, this is my answer, was when I was like, not, I was, I guess I was, I must have been working- at CAA still as an right. assistant. And I, I had been there for like, I was like getting, I was like curdling. I was like milk. I was like so bored there. <laughs> it was not you. I loved the people, but I was like, I had just been there for a long time and I was trying to figure out what to do next. And, um, you know, it's very demoralizing to be an assistant. Um, so I went over to Lu- Louise's house, I guess. I don't remember exactly why, but. I think so we I had a girl talk. Yeah. yeah. I was like <laughs> lamenting, like where having like an existential crisis, like I had literally no idea what to do with my life next or like what to choose or what to anything. And Louise's advice to me was don't worry about the job that you're going after. Like, don't think, is it the perfect job for me? Is it the perfect, you know, um, boss or the perfect colleagues or anything like that? Think about the place that you'll be going every day. And if it's the place that you would want to work and the place that you think you could make a difference, um, because as long as you can get in the door of the building or, you know, in the, in the atmosphere of, of the things that you do want to be a part of, you will figure out a way. And that was such great advice. That was just really wow. great advice. I think so, because I think that once you're in, you walk the halls and you speak to people and you look at someone and you picture, and I probably gave you this a little lecture, you picture, could I do what she's doing? Could I do what he's doing? Would I picture myself doing that? Then you meet them and you say, can I stay late? Can I sit and watch? Can I shadow you? And that's, it, so that worked. Totally. Oh my God. Yeah. Are you kidding? That was like, you know what? I was a writer when I made that, um, when I made the chalkboard video, I was, I had been a writer at Ashton Kutcher's company, just writing, not doing video. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I wanted to do more than write. I wanted to do like other things too, in addition to writing. And just by working at that company in that office building, I um, had the opportunity to create the video department of the company. So. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, like a lot of young people don't really realize how amazing people really stand out. Because a lot of people are just walking through their day. And when you see those sparks, when you're working somewhere and you see that young person and and she's a spark, you notice her and you give her opportunity. You give these people opportunities because they're showing such an interest and they're going above and beyond. And every time you turn around, they're doing something that needed to be done before they were told it needed to be. Those are the people that get to do more fun things. You know, you do the unfun things. You grind it out first five years of adulting. And then the next thing you know, someone's giving you these opportunities that are fun. And that's kind of- I'm glad you're not there anymore, though. You're not (laughs) getting into that meat grinder of talent representation and packaging and all that Hollywood nightmare. You're you're way too gifted for that. But she learned. She learned from it. Yeah. Oh, my God. And it was the best. It was so, um, it was, it was, my mom says it was like the best experience of my life because before that, I like couldn't even- find my keys like any time that I was looking for them literally ever and then <laughs> a lot more organized. I mean another another key to life is not just learning what you want to do but learning ruling things out. And so that's part of like heading in the general direction and going, okay, not not a lot of this stuff, but more of this stuff. I and, loved uh, it. Yeah. I really loved it. I loved the people there more than anything. They were they were my um I my dad died when I was working there and they were like the most incredible support system. Oh. Yeah, I'll never forget nice. them. They were that was, it was time to leave when I had that conversation with Louise. But right. no regrets. Yeah, I think we all. What was your first job in broadcasting, Fritz? I worked for Armed Forces Television and Radio. And then when you the Navy, when you left the, the beauty Navy, of that was, you were even if you sucked, you would never get fired. You just had to show up, have shine shoes, always say sir, and it didn't matter if you knew anything or whether you were any good, you would never get fired. And that's a gift to have the ability to not get fired from your first job. Oh, to, be, to have the ability to fail and learn from it. Yes. 
and and not get fired. It was it was the most liberating thing. But when you left the Navy, was your first job in broadcasting actually being on the air? Yes, it was. I I, I was out of work for one day. Uh, I I got out of the Navy in February of 1972. I, I took one day to go to the optometrist and get new glasses. The day after that, I got a job at WIFI, a rock and roll radio station in Philadelphia. Then I went to Syracuse, New York, because I followed a girl who was a Syracuse University student. Then I went to Buffalo, where I had the great gift of meeting Sherry Margolis <laughs> and working with her in an underfunded newsroom. And then I came out to California to do comedy and all those things. So See, everything you do is a path is part of your pathway, whether it's mm -hmm. your media pathway or your career pathway. It's all part of your pathway. So take it in and learn from it. I want to thank you so much, Jordan, for joining us. One of my favorite people, Jordan Zaslow. What a treat. What a and treat. here come the closing credits. We would love for you to join us online on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at Media Path Pod, and on Facebook, where we are Media Path Podcast. You can find full episodes with all kinds of bonus videos visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. And thank you to our guest, George Zaslow, and to Sharon, say her full name, Fritzy. Townsend, Sharon Townsend. Sharon Townsend. Our team She's includes Dina Friedman, Francesco DeManda, Mosey Masenko, John Maddox, Bill Filipiak, Thomas Hubble, and you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of this adventure. I am Louise Palanker here with Fritz Coleman, and we will see you along the Media Path.